Today on the future of everything, the future of sleep. Now, if there's one thing you can yet usually get people talking about, it's the quantity and quality of their sleep. Especially for those who are not satisfied for one of those, they can describe their habits, their rituals, rules that they use to try to ensure a good night's sleep. Now, most of us have had at least a few bad nights of sleep and know how profoundly it can affect our mood and our performance, not only the next day, but for a couple of days after that. Many also know those magical mornings when you wake up and feel perfectly refreshed and ready to take on the world, not to mention the joy of a good nap. But the connection between sleep and mental health has long been recognized. Sleep has deep connections with the physiology of mood, appetite, weight, perceptions of pain, and the state of the immune system. And trouble with sleep is a very common problem that physicians uh, see with their patients all the time. Dr. Rafael Palayo is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the Stanford Center for Sleep Sciences and Medicine. Rafael, why do we need sleep at all? And what do we know about the consequences of not getting enough? First, thank you for having me here and hi to everybody out there listening. I, I appreciate it. Um, why we sleep is what drove me to become a sleep doctor. That question, that was the essential question in my mind and we don't know, but I remember as a medical student thinking someday it's going to be figured out and I at least want to be in a position where I read the journal article when it emerges. I don't know if I'm going to be the researcher that does it, but I want to, I want to be aware of it. Why do we sleep and why do we dream? In fact, my, 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 my Gmail tag is why sleep, right? That's my oh, always a question. The, um, Bill DeMent passed away recently. I know Professor DeMent. And yes, William well, you know, DeMent's he, a giant in the sleep field. Yeah, he, he, he was the one who established our field as a clinical specialty. And he was interviewed in the media, and they asked him that same question. And he said, the reason we sleep is so we don't feel sleepy. <laughs> people laughed at him. They laughed, just like you're laughing now. They laughed at him because it seems like such a circular argument. But it gets at this fundamental thing that – the sleep will have multiple functions. To think of sleep as a single function item won't make any sense because it's so ubiquitous among all living things, this basic rest activity cycle. So it can't have just one single function. And one of the uh, early uh, other sleep scientists that had a quote that I love that I use all the time is if sleep has no function, it's the biggest mistake evolution ever made because it's an inherent paradox of sleeping. All animals, as far as we know, sleep. All animals that have been studied sleep. We've not been able to study every single animal, but in general, all animals sleep. But animals that are sleeping are vulnerable being attacked. So if sleep has no, you would think that the animal that slept the least would have an, an evolution advantage over all the other animals. Right. But it's not that way at all. So we sleep despite the fact that we're vulnerable being attacked, but it also explains a lot about how humans sleep and gets to the issue of what happens when we don't sleep because the way we sleep actually is um, protect us from our environment. There, there are cycles to the way we sleep. So every animal, as far as we know, whenever they're sleeping, there's built-in defenses into it, right? Huh. How, can a, how can a woman be able to uh, have a newborn baby if, uh, and feed that baby every two to four hours if we really have to sleep eight hours in a row? Right. In fact, we're biologically built to sleep in segments. And the issue, nobody really sleeps eight hours in a row. You only think you have. You only wow. sleep about an hour, an hour and a half at a time. And then you wake up, make sure everything's okay, and you go back to sleep. Um, when you don't get enough sleep, what happens, the original experiments, and I don't do this kind of research, but the original experiments were what happens if you just sleep deprived an animal? Well, they die. They eventually die. And when they die, people don't appreciate when an animal is sleep deprived to the point of death, which is actually a form of torture and unethical now, um, or always was unethical, but that, that research was Now it's done. officially unethical. Yes, it's officially unethical. Um, what the animal dies of is an infection. And now we're talking huh. about not during the time of the pandemic, they die of sepsis. Um, and, and there's a very strong link between our immune function and how we sleep. Animals that don't get enough sleep are more prone to infections. Humans, adults, there's some studies, both young people have been studied. When you sleep deprive them, their reaction to immunization decreases and they're more prone to getting colds and viruses. So anybody who's sick out there, uh, you're not, gonna, not going to sl work your way through an infection. The first thing we innately do when we get sick is get into bed. Right. And the fact, the way we, we think about size of a hospital, we rate hospitals based on number of beds that they have. I don't know if any other industry does this, 
we don't talk about hotels. Hotels talk about rooms. A hospital talks about how many beds does it have. It has a hospital, it measures the number of beds that it has. Because you have to get into bed when you're sleepy, when, when you're ill. Right. So if that's what happened. And the other thing that'll happen, if I may, um, you, and, and obviously not sleeping and, and dying is at the extreme. Just a little bit of lack of sleep. There are a lot of people to deal with. The first thing you notice somebody doesn't get enough sleep is we tend to be irritable yes. and inattentive. We tend to wake up cranky, irritable and inattentive, right? You, uh, you go to, if, you, if you were to, able to travel and go to Disneyland, you'll see that they're selling lots of coffee mugs with grumpy on it. And, 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 uh, because there's always people saying, oh, don't talk to me before I have my coffee. One of my favorite dwarfs from Snow White, yes. Yes, of course. My kids um, tell me I remind them of, of, of grumpy. Well, maybe you need a little more sleep. But, but <laughs> the point is that you should, you, should not, uh, you should be able to wake up feeling refreshed. Yeah. Right? And the first sign of, lack, of lacking sleep is being cranky and irritable. And one of the beauties of being a sleep doctor, the reason it's a fun gig, is that the patients get better. And you bring families together. And you're just more pleasant to live with when you get better quality sleep. So anyway, that's so, a long answer to a Yeah, that's question. great. No, so speaking of that, I know you've, you've done a lot of work and one, uh, that's gotten a lot of attention. And, and one of the great areas is, um, I, I believe you've come out as part of a group against daylight savings time. And I, I'm seeing a huge swell of like, we don't like daylight savings time. And it sounds like there might be a scientific basis for uh, abolishing these uh, twice a year hour changes, which I just find incredibly frustrating, especially the one in the fall. Talk to me about what, what would be the scientific basis for our arguing against daylight savings? Well, daylight savings was always proposed as an economic argument, not a scientific or health uh, argument. And the economic principles behind it seem not to be valid. So the reason we do this was never for our health. It was to save energy. And it turns out those energy savings are not there. So if the economic reasons aren't there, then why are we doing this? Right? It certainly is a nuisance to change our clocks twice a year. We're a sleep-deprived society in general. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that the fall bothers you. And the fall is actually when people are happier because we gain an hour. The springtime is when we lose an hour. And as a society, we don't have an hour extra to give up. We're really sleep deprived to begin I see. with. Yeah, I think the thing about fall is I, I hate how it's getting dark. That's probably what's overwhelming my decision about that time and, change. And, and of course, and, and, you know, and of course, some people will prefer that, all right? Um, the... Um, the way to think about daylight savings to make it easy to remember, because I get tripped up on it all the time as I think about it, is what you're doing is you're switching morning light for afternoon light. And that's yeah. all it is. Yeah. You're giving up morning light for afternoon light. So when we go back to standard time, you are going to have uh, sundown show up earlier. So the day will appear shorter to you. Um, and people may like having these long summer days and their issues with it, but it's an artificial situation. So there's... There is no medical biological reason to do this. Studies in teenagers have shown that if you uh, sleep deprive them by one hour in the springtime, it takes up about five days for them to get back to the baseline level of alertness. And because of the circadian system, which is what we're, we're playing with, is the biological yep. clock in our heads, yep. the, um, it's not meant to take one hour shifts that way. If you normally, let's say, sleep eight hours a night and you skip those eight hours, your brain will not allow you to sleep 16 hours in a row the very next day. It's yep. not biologically safe to do that. You'll catch up that time over time. So the data with the teenagers was that that one hour loss uh, on that Saturday to Sunday ends up with a two and a half hour loss of total sleep as they reset themselves. But they've been found that uh, with daylight savings in the springtime associated with increased car accidents, increased strokes, heart attacks, people are stressed when they're getting less sleep. And we're, artificially inducing a sleep deprived society an hour of sleep loss. So the position of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and other organizations um, has been that there's no medical reason to do this anymore. Just and and it sounds like there are medical problems that it introduces that are, that are unnecessary. This yeah, is the future. De 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 there are deaths every year because of it. I'm sorry to interrupt you. There are deaths every year because of this. I, I was just going to say that this is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Dr. Rafael Paleo about sleep and its importance. Uh, I, another thing that I saw in, in, in your work is commentary about couples sleeping in the same bed. And I got to tell you, my wife and I are looking for a new bed. It is especially in a pandemic, virtually impossible to find a bed that we can both agree on. Tell me about, um, and I also think of uh, Ricky Ricardo and Lucille Ball, who always had their beds separate in that show that I watched way too much when I was growing up. What is the science about whether I should be sleeping in the same bed as my wife? 
the, 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 the bottom line on this is that the need for sleep is biological, but the way sleep is learned. We're taught how to sleep. So we develop habits. And what will occur early on in any relationship, um, the first time you got to spend a, a night with your, with your significant other, you're just lucky to be there, right? You're just happy to, to share that space with that person. And when you looked at that bed, um, one of you picked a side, whoever right. it was. And the other one was just, again, I'm lucky to be here. I just get whatever side is left. I'll be there. And henceforth, that becomes her side and his side or his side, whatever the 36 is. years, we have never, I cannot do it any other way. Right. And, and you'll see this, that you, you'll stay in that side. And you talk to parents when they have little kids, they say, oh, you know, Johnny comes into the bedroom and wakes us up at night. If I talk to Johnny, he goes, Johnny, why do you wake up? Dad, you know, well, they know what side he's on. Why do you go to dad's side? Well, mom won't wake up. or the other way around. Uh, the kids already know where, where, where to go to. Couples will pick their sides and stay on that side. And you don't so ever switch sides to the hell of it. Except for older, older couples. They will switch sides sometimes when they travel because they have an agreement among, among themselves that one of them sleeps, uh, whoever gets up more often to go to the bathroom at night, uh, that they, they want to then have a shorter walk to the bathroom. That's the only time they switch sides. Is, is, and that's super practical. And if you don't believe me that sleep is learned, simply rotate your body and put your feet where your pillow normally goes and rotate your body in the bed. You're going to feel completely weird. Same mattress, same everything. Right, right. So as far as couples sleeping together or not, um, it is a preference, right? Um, young people, when you're, when you're a little kid, you'll sleep anywhere. You remember sleeping on the floor of a friend's house in a sleeping bag. Absolutely. You won't do that now. When you're in college, I just want a sofa to crash on, right? I'm happy to just sleep there. I was comfortable there. As we get older, we tend to prefer more surfaces. And where you sleep becomes more of a, of a luxury item. Mattress has a whole industry of them. So some people will prefer separate beds. Actually, um, I just, somebody interviewed me about in Europe, it's, it's, they keep the same bed in some places, um, Scandinavia, but they have two separate blankets. That's another way of doing it. Some people yeah. like warmer or softer, so you can get two separate, two separate So blankets. there's no battles over the covers. No battles over the covers or also the temperature, ah. right? Somebody sleeps warmer than the other. And this is, uh, and one of them, especially as, as people get older, sometimes they get a little more uh, fussy about the, the room temperature. Yes. So and, I, and I don't know if this is a bunch of hooey, but there's also a whole folklore, if you internet, if you Google this stuff, about whether you're a side sleeper and a back sleeper or a, an, or a stomach sleeper, and then what kind of mattress you need. And that's one of the things, uh, my wife and I are not the same kind of sleepers by, by that rubric. And so we are paralyzed about what kind of bed to get. Um, even though it's killing my back right now and I got to do something about it. So, so this is a real thing. And um, uh, so, so do you ever prescribe separation of bed or is that way too personal to, for even for a physician to get involved with? Actually, I bring couples together more often huh. because, because of the snoring. People end up in separate bedrooms a lot. They end up often in separate bedrooms. Um, and it, it's a lot of times, um, you know, you'll see the guy will come in and there's all kinds of couples, all kinds of relationships. So I'm just going to generalize the man, woman, but there's obviously all kinds of combinations. Sure. So I'm just generalizing to make this easier to have a conversation. But the guy will come in and says, I say, why are you here? So, well, my wife claims I snore. Right. My wife, and, and in my experience, the wife's 100 percent accurate. I haven't seen a single wife be wrong yet. If right. the wife says you snore, you do snore. Why, yeah, why it's, would they it's a hard make thing that to up? figure out. Why would you make that? Exactly. Why would you make that? Why would they make that up? Uh, but they say things like, well, she just needs to get earplugs. I'm just fine. And I'm like, go home and give her a kiss. She's maybe saving your life. We're going to take care of your sleep apnea. But they end up in separate bedrooms. And I've also seen women who have ended up in separate bedrooms. Women who snore have higher divorce rates than men who snore, for example. Snoring wow. is one of the most common reasons. People among the most common, it's in the top five reasons people file for divorce. Well, you can imagine that if it, if, if it hurts the sleep, it causes irritability, that just accentuates all the issues that may be there. It's kind of sure. easy to believe. So, so if they have sleep apnea, for example, we put them on CPAP, we can bring them together. People think, oh, the machine is going to drive us apart. It's not sexy. Quite the opposite. It rejuvenates you. Yeah. Um, and and it, it sounds like a cynical thing to say. It's crazy thing to say. But I tell patients, I have made many wives happy because we get to bring them together with their spouses again uh, because now you can share a bed. And it becomes an issue when people travel. Uh, for example, they may have separate, separate beds in their homes, but when they travel, do they get separate hotel rooms? Right. Or, do they, or when they I visit friends pricey. or relatives? When they visit friends, they're kind of embarrassed that they know that they're sleeping separate because it's yeah. been like a, like, 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 a, like a shame thing. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, so I do recommend some people sleep separate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, things with older couples with uh, who have what's called parasomnias, where people act out their sleep, and their people can be violent in their sleep. Um, 
or early Parkinson's disease, for example, may be particularly violent in the way they sleep with thrashing. So we say maybe sleep in a separate space, although a less expensive thing to do, and, and let's face it, you know, you can only put somebody in a separate bedroom if you can afford a separate bedroom. Right. You know, right. They're, they're, That's they're a luxury. Disparities. Right. It's a complete luxury. You can only put a kid in a separate room if you can afford a separate room. But sometimes I'll say instead is put, put, one of, put one member of the couple in a sleeping bag in the same bed. Uh-huh. Um, so you can get like a summer, like, like a light bag. You can even get one secondhand at a yeah. thrift store, a thin bag. And you know, the bag the zippers one side. Yes. So put the side that does not zipper the, the you know, the, the other side towards your partner. That way you're less likely to reach over and, and hit them or thrash and kick over. Oh, that's to their a side. great, there's a tip about what to use with your sleeping bags when you can't go camping. That's right. That's right. Now, obviously, you want to wear a little less clothing because they're warm. You want to get the right. thinnest bag you can find. But the idea behind that is you create two separate sleeping environments in the same bed. And I've done that with many, many patients over the years as a way of just making the less likely to interrupt the other person's sleep. So, yeah, that's, that's great. So let me just, like, a couple of topics I just definitely wanted to get to. And one is I've noticed that my iPad wants to change the color of when I'm reading in bed at night. It says, oh, it's, it's late. I'm going to make it more orange and less blue. What, and, and then there's all this thing about don't watch TV right before you go to bed. It's based on the exposure of light to your eyeballs and like what it does to your brain. Can you just kind of unra- unpack that a little bit for us? A couple of things on this. Um, I did see a, a Johnny Carson interview in 1974, 1974 in black and white. And he says, parents blame me that the kids can't sleep right. because they're staying up late. And for those who so don't know, Johnny Carson was the late night, uh, the late night show guy in the sixties and seventies and eighties. Yeah, exactly. But there was no internet back then. There was no pads. So yes, light's important, but the content is what's keeping people awake more than anything else. Huh. Now, th- there's a really cool part to the science story behind this. Well, when we were in medical school, you and I, we were always taught that there are two kinds of photoreceptors, the rods and the cones, right? And, um, and the rods do black and white and the cones do color. And that's how we see things. It turned out that there was a third photoreceptor this whole time that got overlooked by the field. Oh my these goodness. intrinsic photoreceptic ganglion cells. And they have a single function. Everything else in the retina is polysynaptic. Very complex structure, the retina, I imagine. But there's a third photoreceptor there that has a single wire, monosynaptic connection to the biological clock. It has a single function to know when dawn occurred. You need to see the light. Wow. And that photoreceptor, these intrinsic photoreceptor ganglions, it's a really cool story to read if you're into the history of science, um, preferentially re- uh, react to blue light. Ah. And that's the thing. That's a high energy light. So these photoreceptors are queuing into blue light. So what they're doing a lot these days is they're putting in filters into systems to block out the blue light. And again, if you think about the basic reason why we sleep, if sleep is inherently dangerous and we're social creatures, right? If we go hunt, uh, walking at night in, in the woods around here, we can be attacked by a mountain lion. We right. don't go walking alone right. in the dark in the woods around where we live, right? But 10 of us will take on any mountain lion if we had to. So if we're going to be hunting and gathering, the first thing we have to be able to do to hunt and gather is to show up at the same time to hunt and gather. We have to be able to do this. And we have to, we're diurnal creatures. We must predict dawn and dusk. But how do you predict dawn and dusk? And a planet where the days get longer and days get shorter. So the clock in your head must predict dawn by the light that hits your eyes. So these photoreceptors are set up to let us know Dawn occurred at this time, and it'll occur about the same time tomorrow. That's what word circadian means, about a day. Gotcha. gotcha. But artificial light throws all that off. So we sleep more typically in long winter nights and sleep less in short summer nights. But once you have the bright light coming into your eyes, the blue light especially, it makes the brain think it's a, always a short summer night. But it's not just the light. It's the content. And, I've, and, I, and I believe, and I've written that, just blocking the blue light on your iPad is like right. putting a filter on a cigarette. It's right. sure. It may it's do still something. a cigarette. <laughs> it's still getting nicotine and right. you still have the content still staying awake and you're still refusing to go to bed when you should. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. More with Dr. Rafael Palaio next on Sirius XM. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Dr. Rafael Paleo about sleep. And Rafael, I wanted to turn to the pandemic. This has been a stressful time for everybody. I can't even imagine what it might be doing to people's sleep. So can you tell me what are you seeing in your practice, uh, in your sleep practice uh, under these uh, 
very extraordinary circumstances. The pandemic has been awful. I mean, people are dying. It's, it's really showing up the healthcare disparities in our system. Um, it, it's, it's, it's just one, something we'll never forget and how it's affected people. At the same time, oddly, but I guess not so oddly, I've had many patients tell me they're sleeping better than ever. Uh, a lot of people, really? me, especially a lot of people, tell me they're sleeping better than ever. A lot of the young people I'm seeing, teenagers and, and college and college students, saying they're sleeping better, which and a lot of the adults because it kind of shows you how stressful life in the Bay Area can be. The people can sleep better during a global pandemic because they're no longer commuting. So, so people have these hour hour long commutes that are classic, typical in the Bay Area, they don't have them anymore. Uh, and so that parents, kind of trumps yeah. the fact that the world is falling apart. So if they're fortunate enough, and you have to be fortunate enough to be able to have um, housing security, financial security, yes. still have a job. If, if those things are taken care of, all of a sudden you get to get more sleep and be home. So I have patients that are telling me they're sleeping better than before. I have a whole bunch of people who are sleeping worse. Um, and one of the early stories that came out, um, it was in the news, where people having the more nightmares. You know, yep. If you saw any of this in the news, and, that's, and there was using that as a marker of how stressful life was. And sure, if you have somebody sick, and I know people who died as a consequence of, of this pandemic and have gotten sick. Um, but at the same time, I thought the reason people are having more nightmares is people are having more dreams because what happens is dreams dominate the last third of the night. And when people wake up too early, what they're cutting off is a chance to dream. Huh. So by having sleep extensions, which is now having more time in bed, you're going to catch up on their sleep. And when you catch up on sleep, there's a phenomenon called REM rebound, REM rebound, where you have more dreams of a sudden flooding you. And if your dreams reflect your life, so if you're stressed about things, you'll have more distressful anxiety dreams. But the increased reports of nightmares may be not just the stress of the pandemic, but the fact that you have the luxury of getting more time in bed so you have a chance to sleep more and to dream more. I think that's what's happening. So there is an upside. The news that there's more nightmares, there is an upside to that, which is it's an indication to you that that last one third of sleep is being preserved, which gives us all the opportunity to have those dreams. And then you just kind of hope you get a good one and not a bad one. But that's a, a, a slightly different issue. Um, sure. How are you even seeing patients? You, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that people are not dying to come into the sleep lab right now uh, for evaluation. So uh, how do you actually do your sleep practice under pandemic conditions? It's been very interesting because um, by doing it by, by telemedicine visits, um, I, you get to see people in the natural environment where, where they're living because we're making house calls now virtually. Yes. And I remember the very first time, uh, my very first patient that I started to do my first, my very, I'm nervous about using the technology, using the computer and all this stuff. The patient lights up a cigarette on the camera. It's a smoking away. They're outside. I'm like, oh, I didn't. I guess, of, you know, of course they can smoke a cigarette if they want to, but it had occurred to me, when was the last time we ever saw a patient smoke a cigarette in front of yeah, us? Yeah, I haven't they seen a they patient. They can't do that, anymore, right? No, that's so, right. Right. And then I wanted to, this patient happened to be using CPAP, and I got, I said, well, can I see your CPAP machine? So they bring their phone into their bedroom, and they see they have an ashtray full of cigarette butts, and they see their CPAP machine. I'm like, okay, this is part of your life. You're smoking in bed. So it opened up a conversation with the patient an yes. aspect of it that it would not typically have occurred to me to discuss with them because I now see them in their actual environment that they're in. Um, so, so that's been an interesting aspect of it. As far as the rest of the things, um, we are practicing sleep medicine. Stanford became, uh, got very strict. We shut down the labs initially. There was news stories of how CPAP machines were acting like um, just blowing up the, the virus in, in nursing homes uh -huh. because the CPAP devices have motors in them and they're open systems. They're not ventilators. So if you happen to be infected with the virus, now you had the system where you had a motorized mechanism to blow out the virus to wider group of right. people. Right. Um, Scary. So we had so we had to come up with ways of, of of modifying our equipment, and also patients, as you said, we're not we're reluctant to come into the sleep lab. Not only do we don't want to get them sick, we don't want them getting our staff sick either. Um, so we've had to set up with whole PPEs and we've come up with new protocols for this. But what the pandemic has done is accelerated forces that were already happening in sleep medicine, not just in telemedicine, but greater use of home sleep testing devices. Mm -hmm. So the device, you can measure somebody's sleep in their own home. Um, it's not as accurate, it's, it's not as, as sensitive as doing it in the lab, but it's good enough for many, many people. But the devices we were using were devices that you had to clean. So you would send them to the patient and then they would send them back and clean them and wait a few days. So 
we've accelerated the use of disposable systems, which bothers me in the sense that we may increase our medical waste. On the other hand, we have a system that is now in one way where you can mail the device to a patient, right. they sleep with it in their own home, they upload the data to the cloud and then throw it away. No, that um, sounds transformative. And, and we're hearing stories about telemedicine accelerating and it might be one of the lingering, in fact, probably good uh, side effects of this whole pandemic. I, be, be, before we run out of time, though, I, I'm sure people want to know about sleeping medications. Everybody wants, everybody's looking for that, especially folks who are having trouble sleep. They want to know, is there a medication that's going to solve my sleep problems? And I'm sure you have knowledge and opinions about this. So uh, in the last minute and 55 seconds, tell me about uh, sleep medications and what their appropriate role is and what people should expect and not expect. People often say things to you, I can't sleep because I can't turn off my brain. And you're not supposed to turn off your brain. You only turn it off once. <laughs> Sleeping is an active situation. You have to be alert to your environment. People want that on-off switch for their brain and they want to be sedated. You cannot equate sedation with sleep. Alcohol is very sedating, but you don't get a good night of sleep with it. Sleeping pills are simply tools. Hypnotic sleeping pills have gotten safer over time, not stronger. We had stronger sleeping pills in the 50s and 60s than we have now, but they've gotten better. At the same time, our knowledge of sleep has improved. So now the tendency has been to no longer use medication as a first line treatment, but instead to go kind of be able therapy. But we have excellent medications for sleep. You should not be scared of using them. Okay. Um, um, in fact, well, prescription medications may be safer than prescription ones, than over-the-counter ones, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Like Tylenol PM, uh, for example, is one that can be very dangerous to use on a regular basis because it can cause liver damage. So that's great to hear. So what I'm hearing you say is that medications are available. They can be, uh, they can be very useful. And you're not giving a blanket, don't use them. But, you're, but oh. under the supervision of somebody like you, they can be part of a, of a strategy for uh, helping with, with, with sleep. Our goal for every patient is the same. Fall asleep easily, sleep through the night, wake up refreshed, and ideally without any medication. But medications are a tool that we'll use to get to that place. There you have it. Thank you for listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.